So before we get started, I want to do a lot today here. Um, you have a kind of a long assignment. Those of you that have started working on it, you may have the sense that you really don't know what you're doing. Um, or maybe this that you're not sure exactly how to proceed in a nice, elegant way. And you're, you're getting these really crazy big numbers and all this stuff. I'm going to try to bridge the gap here a little bit today. So I'm not going to do a lot of proofs. I'm going to do some examples. Um, I'm going to focus more on, on uh, techniques for solving these problems than, than I am writing a lot of proofs. Uh, I'm going to do maybe one proof, but that's about it. Um, OK, so I want you to keep in mind that uh, you do have your next exam coming up next Thursday. Okay, So um, I will tell you this. I'm not going to do a new section. So we're just going to stay on this section for this week. All right. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff thrown into this. And so um, this is actually one of the few sections where kind of the goal is to apply the theory in order to solve some of these problems in an elegant way. And that's, that's really what I'm trying to get across this week. Um, so we're going to do some more today. That'll enable you to do a few more of the homework problems. And then by Thursday, then you should have enough of the tools to be able to finish the assignment. And then, of course, we can talk a little bit more next Tuesday. But remember, this assignment's not due until next Thursday, so you still have plenty of time to finish it up. Okay. All right. Let's see. So. Yes. Yes. That's still the plan. Yep. Okay. So what I want to do to start with is. Um, Go over actually one of your homework problems. Um, in fact, it's the very first one. Really, at this point, you're you're really only equipped to really do the first two, based on what I've done in lecture so far. So, and that you know, again, I, I wasn't intending you to be able to do all the problems. And if you're thinking, oh, he didn't tell me all this other stuff. Well, that wasn't the intention. That's why I made the due date next Thursday, so we can finish this stuff up. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. To begin, I, I definitely want to make sure I allocate some time to this. I think this is probably even more important than moving on. It's just getting you uh, kind of a good base for understanding the ideas behind these problems. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about just your very first problem, number one, part A, which is to solve. I'm not going to write all of this out, but you're, you're solving this congruence. 25x congruent to uh, 15 mod 29. Okay. And here I, I want to try to be somewhat clear about what I, what kind of work I'm expecting for these. First of all, I want to tell you, uh, those of you that have already tried to work through this, maybe you've noticed this. Every single homework problem, every problem in 4.4, the solution is in the back. So the, not the worked out solution, but the actual final answer is in the back. Yeah? Uh, just to refresh, is that saying that um, the remainder of 25 and 15 is the same as the Yes, 25x. 25x and 15. Yes, that's right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, there's, there's several ways that you can look at this. But um, so one way is just that, yeah, they, the, both sides have the same remainder when you divide by 29. Another way of looking at it, which is the definition, is that 29 divides 25x minus 15, right? They, they're equivalent, really. But I think the remainder point of view is going to help you more um, when you go through the problem. So here's what I'm trying to convey. I don't, first of all, if you just give me the answer, of course, the answer is in the back of the book by itself. You're going to get almost no points. You may not get any points at all because the answer is in the back of the book. All you have to do is look at it and copy, write it down. That, that's just not going to give you, give you points. I want to see some technique that's beyond that of, you know, beyond what you would have done, say, in 10th grade when you didn't know anything about congruences. I expect you to show me that you can actually apply some of these results to solve the problem. Not that you're, and I, you know, I, I don't want to see things like, you know, x is negative 50 billion and 929,006 or something like that. I, I mean, I, I really don't want it to just be beating on it until you finally get lucky and get the answer. I, I want you to use some techniques, and I'm going to show you what I mean here, okay? You can solve this problem in about three lines. Okay, actually showing the work, um, you, you can you can do it all without a lot of work. You just have to understand the, the idea behind it. So here's what you're going to do. Here's one thing that you can do. Okay, now you you might say after I'm done with this, you might say, well, how would I know how to do that? Well, that's the whole point though of what I'm going to do this week is to show you. I'm going to give you some examples, and eventually, if you incorporate these ideas, you, you you should start to get this down. Okay, so here's one thing to notice. First thing. So what is the first thing we want to do? The first thing is determine if there's a solution, right? Okay, so if there's no solution, of course, you're done. 
don't, you know, you, you should do that first, right? Because otherwise you're just wasting your time. So the first question, I'm going to go through this in a little more detail than I will the other problem, but. Is there a solution? Okay, so we've talked about this before, right? So what's the answer to this? Is there a solution to this? There's something we have to check here, right? Yes. What is it that we have to check? We have to ch check to see if the GCD of A and C divides B. That's exactly when it has a solution, right? So the GCD, I'm not going to write the A and C down here, but it's just, it goes in order, right? I'm, so, or, yeah, so I guess maybe what, sorry, it wasn't C, it was N. Uh, if the GCD of A and N divides B, right? I used the N instead of C, I think, last time in the lecture. Okay. Well, what's A? A is 25. What's N? It's 29. What's this equal to? What's one? It's definitely one, right? For sure. 29 is prime. It's got to be one. And of course, anytime you get a GCD of one, it's always going to have a solution because one divides everything. So one's definitely going to divide B. One's going to divide 15. I'll just write this out, but of course this is true. So, how many solutions are there? Mod 29. There's one, right? The number of solutions is equal to the GCD, assuming the GCD divides B, right? No, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's fine. I mean, if you just give me the solution, I'll know that you know that there's only one. Um, okay, so now here's, here's the, the, one, of the, one of the ways you can go about doing it. This is a very short way. I'm not saying that this is the only way you could solve it, but this is maybe the best way that you can do it. That's what I'm going to show you right now. Okay, so what we have is... Okay, here's the congruence that we're given. 25x congruent to 15 mod 29. And so what we're really looking for here, we're, we're looking for the solution, and I would like you to do this. I don't know that I'm going to take points off, but I would like you to do this. I would like you to give me the solution. I would like you to give me the smallest solution. In other words, don't give me 50 billion and 6. Give me a number between 0 and 29. Okay. And so if you, if you have something that's bigger than 29, you just take the remainder upon division by 29, and that reduces it modulo 29, right? Right? 30, for example, is 1, right? Mod 29 has a remainder of 1. Okay. Well, so, and since this isn't a proof, I'm, I'm going to be content with just kind of being a little bit informal. Okay, so this is 5 times 5x, right? Congruent to 5 times 3 mod 29. Okay, now, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back and, and tell you exactly what the theorem numbers are, but this is something that is in your notes, and I'm going to state it, and you can rewrite it again. Um, I'm not going to write it down, but there is a theorem, and this is going to help you to simplify things. So, what would I like to do? Okay, well, I have this congruence 25x congruent to 15 mod 29. What I want to do, and this is, I can't overemphasize this, what you really want to do is try to make these coefficients, the 25 and the 15, you want to try to do some, you know, use some tricks to make those numbers as small as possible. The smaller they get, the easier life becomes, very roughly, okay? So once I have this, I can actually cancel the fives out on either side. Now, there's, okay, I want to be very clear on this though. It's not the case that you can always cancel. That's not the case. I want you all to listen to this. You can cancel because the 5 is relatively prime to the modulus. And that is in your notes. That's a theorem in your notes. Are you guys with me on this? If it's not relatively prime in general, you can't do that. But because it's prime, of course 29 is prime, so these are automatically relatively prime. That's why you can do it. Is everyone clear on that, on that point? Okay.
Okay, and because I want to get through a lot, I'm not going to write as many notes down as I, I normally do because I, I really want to give you lots of examples. Okay, now we've got this. Well, in, in some sense, it's a little bit nicer, right? The numbers are smaller. Okay, now you... What's that? What did you write? Okay, so what I had before was 5 times 5x is congruent to 5 times 3 mod 29, and I canceled the 5 from both sides because 5 and 29 are relatively prime. Okay. So now I have 5x is congruent to 3 mod 29. Now we want to solve this, and you might say, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to plug and chug. I'm just going to try one, two, three, four, five, and just see, you know, which one works. Well, I, I'd rather you not do that, okay? Here's what I'm going to do, and this, and of course, I've done this before, but here's the idea, okay? If you can, if you can multiply both sides of this congruence by something so that what you have as the coefficient in front of x is only one away from a multiple of 29, then you can solve it immediately. And you'll see this, if you're not sure what I mean, you'll see it in a second. What can I multiply five by? Well, I'm gonna to have to do it to both sides. So that what I get is one away from 29. Six, okay, right? So I'm multiplying by six if you wanna write that down. So I get 30x is congruent to 18 mod 29, okay? That's also, um, I think it was theorem 4.2 in your book. There are all these sub, sort of sub theorems. One of them is that when you have a congruence, you can multiply both sides by anything you want to. You can't cancel anything you want to necessarily, but you can multiply by anything you want to. You can cancel, remember, if, if what, you're multiply, what you have factored out is relatively prime to the modulus, as I just said. Okay, now, well, this is not something specifically, I think, that I, I highlighted. The book kind of glossed over this, and I, I did too, just because there's so much to do here. But anytime you have some product, um, you can always replace any number in that product by what is equal to modulo, whatever the modulus is. So what I mean here is 30 is 1, mod 29, right? It's the remainder of 1 when you divide by 29. So you can replace the 30 with 1. Okay, I, I don't know if I made that totally clear in the lecture. You can do this. This is a, a legal move, okay? So... 1x, or just x, right, is congruent to 18 mod 29. And I'll, I'll just write this sort of parenthetically here. 30 is the same thing as 1 mod 29. That's, that's where this is coming from. Okay, is everybody, everybody with me on this? Replace the 30 with 1 because they're the same, mod 29, right? Okay. Well now, <laughs> okay, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to find an x between 0 and 29 that satisfies this. Of course, we don't really need the 1 on the outside. It's just x, right? So now all you have to do is, and, and this shouldn't be very hard if you just remember what this congruence relation means. We're trying to find a value of x. So what, is, what does this mean? What does this mean? This means 29 divides x minus 18. What's the simplest value of x you can pick between 0 and 29 so that 29 divides x minus 18? 18. 18, all right? It's 0. 29 divides 0. So it, once you've got x isolated, it's easy. You just take x to be whatever is the, the number on the right-hand side. You're done. Are you, guys, are you guys picking this up here? So once you have x congruent to something like that, like mm -hmm. Take x to literally just be equal to whatever that number is on the right. Because okay. So just I want everyone to think about this for a second. I, I just want to reinforce this idea of congruence. Plug in 18 for x. What is this assertion? 29 divides 18 minus 18. That's definitely true because it's 0. Okay? So there's your solution. x equals 18. Now you see, and maybe some of you have started to do this, this homework. Maybe you did a page and a half of work and you had negative 50 million or something coming out from testing all these things, I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to be slicker than that, okay? I'm looking for you to incorporate the techniques, some of these techniques so that you can solve it in a, I, here's, I mean, I can't make this overly precise, but what I'm looking for is a solution that is not the same as a solution that a 10th grader would have given that's never taken this course. That's what I'm looking for. That's the best way I can say it, okay? Like what I did here. You see that this is pretty elegant, right? Okay, that's, that's the kind of stuff I'm, I'm looking for you guys to do. That's the point of this, of this section, is to solve them in a more sophisticated way. Okay, that's, what, that's really what I'm looking for. Any questions about this solution? No? How did you... Uh-huh. Your first step. Mm-hmm. Because you had... 
I'm not sure if I understand how you did the, the first thing you did there, where you have the, because you, I, I don't remember what your numbers were, but you, you canceled, you, you, oh, I canceled something out. Five, yes. And yes. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how you did that. Okay. Okay, so the congruence was 25x is congruent to 15 mod 29. Okay. Okay, so I can I can factor out a 5 from the 25, and I can factor out a 5 from the 15. Right. What I'm not clear about is you said sometimes you can't do that. Right. Okay, so that's, yeah, I was getting at that. So the point is there's, because 5 is relatively, and 29 are relatively prime, 29 is the modulus, I can cancel the 5 out. If you know that you, you have a number on both sides, multiplied on both sides, that's, rel that's relatively prime to the modulus, you can cancel it out from the congruence. And if there's more than one, I can choose any one I want. Sure, okay. sure, yep, yes. That rule that you're referencing is a corollary from a theorem that lets you do a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, like you yes. Can, and if you do that, if, you, uh, if they're not relatively prime, so you mm -hmm. cancel them and you reduce the, the mod part, mm -hmm divided by the GCD, have you ruined anything about the kind of solutions you're going to get? I know you have to scale it back up. So you oh, okay. I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Have you... So, um, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, let me see. Let me, let, me find the, let me find the reference here. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but theorem 4.3. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So the point is, though, that, yeah, I mean, no, you you can. Um, so the, okay. So the point is that you can divide through by anything, um, as long as it divides a, b, and n. You, you can divide through by everything. But the point is that, uh, and it doesn't change the it doesn't change change the solutions. It's just that once if there's more than one solution to the congruence, you have to remember that. Okay, I'm gonna try not to get too far ahead of myself. Um, if you have any number that divides all three, you can divide all three of them by that number, and you have the same. You're going to get the same solution. But you have to remember that you're trying to solve the original congruence. So when you add the n over d, you have to add the n over d from the original congruence, not the the original n, not the new n. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the thing you have to be careful about. Yes. If you're down with this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So part B, you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about it real quick then. Okay. And then I'm going to have to to go on to something else here. But um, does anybody else have any questions about part A? No. Okay. So part B is um, five, and, and actually I think this is a little bit easier. But uh, but yeah, it's a it's a slightly different idea. Five x is congruent to two mod twenty six. Okay. And I'm not going to write everything out here. You, you guys will need to fill in some of the details. Um, if it were up to me, I would go through every little detail here, but we'd be here for three hours, and so I can't, I can't do that. But um, so the same question is, okay, does it have a solution? Well, what's the GCD of 5 and 26? 1. 1 divides 2, of course. has a unique solution again. has one solution, right? Okay, so unique solution. Okay, well, again, so... Let's, let's kind of try to, and you're right, but let's try to incorporate the same kind of strategy here. And what we're going to try to do, if possible, is, well, in this case, of course, we saw that we got a coefficient of 1. If we get a coefficient of minus 1, that's also just good, really. And you'll, you'll see what I mean here in a second. So what can we multiply both sides by so that the coefficient in front of x is close to 26? Well, 5, right? Okay. Okay, so then we get, I'll just write this out. So this is 25x congruent to 10 mod 26. Therefore, okay. So now, yeah, so now the question is, um, you, so th this, this is, I mean, I guess maybe the, the stretch a little bit here, uh, maybe for some of you at first. So you might say, okay, well, 25, well, what's the remainder upon division by 26? 25. So you might say, well, I can't do anything with it because it's just 25. Well, the trick here is that 25 is the same thing as minus 1, mod 26. And again, think about what the congruence means. What does it mean for 25 to be congruent to minus 1, mod 26? It means 26 divides 25 minus minus 1. 
it, which it does, because 25 minus minus 1 is 26. So you can remember that you can go into the negatives to make your number small. You want to make the numbers small in, in magnitude. They don't necessarily have to be positive, but we want to reduce these down as much as we can. That's the rough strategy here, okay? So this becomes minus x is congruent to 10 mod 26, right? Okay, well now, okay, I'm running out of room here, but um, let's see. Ah, crap, I'm do that again, okay. You'd think I would learn this at some point. But, um, okay, so well, now what do we do? Okay, can we choose x to be 10? Does that solve this? No, it doesn't. Yes? Could you multiply everything by negative 1? You could, you could, yes, you could definitely do that. Um, or, yeah, I mean, you can. I'm going to do basically the equivalent of what you're saying. Okay. Um, well, we want everything to sort of zero out like we did before. Well, we can't use 10 because then this is just asserting that 26 divides minus 20, which it doesn't. But we can choose x to be minus 10, right? Because then it's just then this just becomes 10 congruent to 10 mod 26, and that's true because 26 divides 10 minus 10, it's zero. Okay, so let's take x to be minus 10. Well, okay, and and really this is okay. I, I would like you to put your solution between zero and 26. Okay, but so then, the, then you have to just be able to say, okay, well, what, what is minus 10 modulo 26? Really, all you're doing is you're just asking yourself, what do you have to add to 10 to get, to, to get 26? That's all you're asking, okay? And so this is the same thing as what? Mod 26, 16, right? And again, if you're not sure, just check it. You, you, you shouldn't... Ha you shouldn't um, well, let's see. Sorry, I'm being a little sloppy here. That's what I really mean. Okay, all you have to do is ask yourself, okay, is it right? Does 26 divide minus 10 minus 16? Well, what is it? Minus 26. Yes, 26 times minus 1 is minus 26. This is definitely correct. Okay? So when you're, so just to be clear though, when you're, you're trying to say, if this is at all confusing, minus 10, what is it you're looking for? All you're, all you're doing is you're just subtracting 10 off the modulus. That's all you're doing. That's it. Okay. Oh, is this okay? Okay. Well, hopefully this is helping a little bit, just to see kind of where you want to go with these these problems. Um, okay. What I'm going to do. All right. I, I'm I'm not going to get to some of the stuff. I'm not going to get to. But um, I definitely want to talk about number two A because this is the book gives you a hint here. But but I really need to do an example of this. I think. <clears throat> okay. Does everybody have this down now? Yeah. Okay. All right. I had, I had a few people email me about this, number 2A. Um, so once you see the, the idea here, the book gives you a hint, but they don't really explain where this hint comes from. So if you've looked at this, you might be a little confused as to what they're saying. Um, so now you're trying to solve this, what's called a Diophantine equation. We skipped this section, but it's not, you might think, oh, well, he skipped this. He's screwing us now. No, I'm not. I'm really not. Um, okay. Nothing really is, I mean, it, it's just the hint. That, that That's really what you're supposed to follow here. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, you've seen stuff like this in linear algebra. And most of you have probably taken linear algebra, I'm guessing. In fact, you've probably had problems like this. You may have forgotten how to do this, but what you would do is you would say, okay, well, there's more variables than there are equations. There's going to be free variables here. I'm going to let y be t, and I'm going to solve for x, and so t can be anything, and then x is determined by t. Not that easy here, because the point is, you're, in linear algebra, you're solving this in the real numbers. Now you're solving it in the integers, so you can't do that anymore. You know, oh, this is just a linear algebra problem, man. I'm slick. I took linear algebra. I can solve this in one line. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, no, of course not. <laughs> So here's what we're going to do, okay? So we're going to just suppose, and I'm going to kind of walk you through this. Suppose that um, x, y, and what we're going to do this in the same sort of notation that, that you probably use in linear algebra. Well, what's the solution? It's a value of x and a value of y. I'm going to write it as an ordered pair. Um, you don't have to do it this way, but it's, I mean, this is just sort of a standard convention. So let's suppose that x, y is a solution. And we're going to see what has to be true of x and y. 
Okay, so I, I really want you guys to really try to think about this as I go through it so that you'll understand where this hint comes from. Um, then, so the first thing we can observe is that uh, this is very simple. 51y equals 9 minus 4x, right? That's not too hard. You guys buy that? Pretty easy. Hence, 51 divides 9 minus 4x, right? Because, okay, I, I didn't say this explicitly, but of course, the solutions are integers. They're integers, right? So 51 times something is 9 minus 4x, so 51 divides 9 minus 4x. <clears throat> okay, maybe I should have written it the other way, but here's the, here's the first step that you want to take. Thus, um, 4x is congruent to 9 mod 51. Yeah, I should have probably put everything on the other side so you can see this a little bit better, but... Um, this is the point where I want you guys to think about this and make sure you understand this, okay? What, is it, what does this mean? This means that 51 divides 4x minus 9. Well, of course, what I have is 51 divides 9 minus 4x, but if I multiply both sides by minus 1, I get 4x minus 9. And there's a theorem that says if a is congruent to b mod n, the b is congruent to a mod n, it doesn't matter what the order is, right? So this is where this first congruence comes from, I think they give you in the hint in the book, okay? It just, com it just comes from the fact that 51 divides it. That's it. Okay, so now we can use what we know to solve this congruence, right? Okay, so um, what can we say about, here, let me, let me put a little star down underneath this, an asterisk. Does this have a solution? Does it have a solution? I want you guys to be thinking about this. Anyone? Yes, definitely does, right? 4 and 51 are relatively prime. They're relatively prime. Um, so it has exactly one solution. You guys remember this, right? I mean, the, what you're testing is the GCD of this and this dividing that. That's what you're looking for. And whatever the, if, it's, if it does, the number of solutions is the GCD. Um, so this has a unique solution. And again, when I say unique solution, of course, what I mean is mod 51. In other words, there's exactly one number between 0 and 51 that makes this true. Okay. Now, just because this is actually not that hard, the numbers are already really small. Um, that x0 equals 15. It solves this congruence, right? This one, I mean, as it turns out, the numbers aren't very big here. And so, you know, you can just kind of go through them. Um, when you plug in 15, you get 60. 60 minus 9 is 51. So 51 divides it, right? Why are you using um, x0? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, because uh, I'm trying to make a point here in a second. Okay. x itself does not have to be 15. That's, the, that's why I'm not writing x equals 15. x can actually be, uh, x can be, there are an infinite number of possibilities for x. But there's only one number between 0 and 51 that solves it, and that's 15. I'll, I'll, I'll say something more about this in a second. But, so what do we know about x then? So here's the, here's the point. Remember, okay, 4x is congruent to 9 minus 51. X is, a, whatever x is, x is a solution to this congruence right here. But I also know that x not equals 15 is the canonical solution between 0 and 51. So what does that tell us? There's a theorem I, that said when you have this congruence, you know, it has a solution if and only if the GCD of a and n divides b and it, call it D, they're exactly D solutions. Every solution is congruent to one of those modulo N. Since X is a solution to this, X has to be congruent to 15 modulo 51. That's the point, okay? 
Every solution, remember, there's this canonical list of solutions between zero and the modulus. Every solution, even the ones that are outside of it, have to be congruent to exactly one of those guys. That's part of the theorem that I gave you. We didn't incorporate that specifically yet, but we are now. X is a solution. The only solution mod 51 is 15. X must be congruent to that one solution because there's only one possibility. Yes? Now, mod 51, that's a pretty big number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would not want to just jump in there and start trying answers for 51, though. Well, what if I start at zero and it turns out it's 15? Right. Well, this is the one that I just didn't want to spend the time talking about the technique because I want to. I want to get through it. Um, these techniques that I've told you in the last two problems, you know, these these are still yeah. Um, but I just I just don't have the time to go through all that here. But I mean, that's a good question. In other words, don't actually do that. Well, I mean, this is where it gets really sticky because I mean, you know, where where does it be, where does it become unreasonable to just sort of do the guess and check method? You know, uh, I don't have a, a great answer to that. Um, but, you know, in general, when the numbers get really big, this is when I, I kind of expect it, you know. Um, I can say more about what I'm expecting later, but I want to just get through this now. But, I mean, it's a good question. I just don't, I just need to really get through this. Okay, so since um, X is also a solution, And 15, this is, the, this is the point I want to make. 15 is the unique solution mod 51. We must have um, x is congruent to 15 mod 51. Okay, again, remember, this is the part of the theorem that we haven't really used yet. There are exact, d is the GCD, it divides b. There are exactly d mutually incongruous solutions modulo n. Every solution, even the ones that are out bigger than n or negative, every one of those is congruent to exactly one of those guys mod n. And because there's only one, x has to be congruent to 15 because that's the only one there is. Okay. Okay. So, and here's where the next part of the hint comes from. This may be seem mysterious at first, but now we're just going to use the definition of congruence. Okay. Hence, 51 divides x minus 15. Right. So, say 51t equals x minus 15 for some for some integer t, right? So if we solve this for x, we get x equals uh, 15 plus 51t. Unbox this, we're going to use this in a minute. Does this make sense? You see, I'm just using the definition of congruence. It means 51 divides x minus 15. That means 51 times an integer is x minus 15. Solve it for x. Not that, it's not that bad, really. Now we're going to do the same thing the other way. We also have another congruence going on here. Um, let's see. So um, uh, this is sort of, maybe you can start a new paragraph here. I just want to use all the space here. Um, I'm going to skip one step here, but uh, I, I want you to take a second to make sure you understand this. 4 divides 9 minus 51y. That's, for, that's just from the original equation. Do you guys see that? Just subtract the 51y, then you get 4 times something is 9 minus 51y. So 4 divides it. And we're just going to play the same game and do the same thing. Fifty-one y then is congruent to nine mod four, right? Again, I kind of did this backwards, but 
you know, again, this just means, what is this saying? This says that 4 divides 51y minus 9. It's true. It's just multiplied by minus 1 on both sides. Okay, well, again, so is there, is there a solution to this? Yes, right? What's the GCD of 51 and 4? Well, it's the same. I mean, it's just things are, the only difference here is that the numbers just got interchanged. The positions just got flipped, right? So, yes, there's a unique solution again. And now it's modulo 4. Okay, well, now we can employ our, our tricks here because this is going to be really quick. Um, we can reduce, we don't really need to worry about multiplying by things. 4 is already a really small number. Let's just reduce the big numbers mod 4 to get things, to get numbers between 0 and 3, right? 51 and 9, we can reduce both of these mod 4 to get very small numbers, and it's very easy to solve, right? Okay, so somebody tell me, what is 51 mod 4? What's that? 3, Three right? Hopefully you guys are getting this. I, ex I expect you guys to start to get this stuff down, okay? You're just dividing 51 by 4 and asking the remainder. Well, 4 goes into 48, and 51 is 3 more than that. So there's a, re there's a remainder of 3 when you divide by 4. 51 is, is 3 then, right? And 9 is 1, right? When you divide by 4, you have a remainder of 1. Okay, so... Um, this just becomes 3y is congruent to 1 mod 4. And I'm going to do the same thing. What's the sort of canonical solution to this? I'm going to, again, I'm going to call this y sub 0. What do we want here? What's our solution? I'm looking for a number to plug in here, so between 0 and 3, so that 4 divides this minus 1. That's all I'm looking for. 3, right? I hope you guys are, uh, if, if you're not, I, I want to answer questions. I really want you guys to be picking this up here. You plug in 3, I mean, you only have to, you only have to test, you have to test 4 numbers, 0, 1, 2, and 3. 3 is the one that makes this congruence work out, okay? So, so, This solves the congruence. So then I'm just going to say as above then, because y is a solution. Um, see if I can squeeze this in here. So then y is congruent to 3 mod 4, right? Okay, that is really, okay, sorry about that. Y is congruent to 3, you can't really make this happen, 3 mod 4. Okay, right, because y was also a solution to it. And there's only one mod 4, so y has to be congruent to that one. That's why I'm writing this down, part of the theorem that I gave you. <clears throat> okay, I'll wait till you guys get this. Uh, any questions so far, by the way? No? Okay, how much? Does everybody have this down now? Anybody need some more time? No? I can go to the next page now? Okay. Okay, so you don't need to write this down again. I'm just writing it down so, so that you see where we were. So y was congruent to 3 mod 4. I just wrote that down. So this implies that 4 divides y minus 3, right? And again, we're just going to do exactly what we did before. So we're just going to write this out now. Um, so then we can say that, say, 4s equals y minus 3 for some s in z, right? Hence, if we solve for y, we get y equals 3 plus 4s. 
And I think maybe this is also is in your book, as in the hint part, I think, gave you this. Then I think the last part of it, if I remember right, said find the relation between S and T or something like that, right? Um, okay, well, you're not done yet. So what you want to get is, so you've got these two variables floating around, but there is a relationship between them, and you want to find out what that is. And so um, here's what you do. Uh, and you may have remembered this um, maybe from calculus or something um, when you did implicit differentiation a couple of times and find, found the second derivative with implicit differentiation, you did something like this. Um, well, what was the original equation? 4x plus 51y equals 9, right? That was the equation we're trying to solve. Okay, so here's the point. Now I'm going to write it, I'll write down some of the details. I won't write down everything, but the point is this is x and y in the very beginning were chosen, it was chosen to be a solution to this. So x and y satisfy this equation just by definition. That's what, that's what they are. So once I know what x is in terms of t and what y is in terms of s, now I have an equation I can solve for one in terms of the other. And so now s and t are now related and I can reduce this down to a single um, parameter instead of two parameters. And I'll show you how this goes. It's not anything deeper than what you did in linear algebra. It's, it's, at this point, it's just basic stuff, okay? Um, so let's see. So um, four times, make sure that you, you see where I'm getting this. What was x? It was 15 plus 51t. And y was, uh, we have that above, 3 plus 4s, right? <coughs> okay, you, I really encourage you to pause and make sure you understand where I'm getting this. this I solved for x and t before, right? I'm just plugging them in now into this equation. <clears throat> Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna spare you the the, the basic eighth grade stuff here, but um, w you can all do this. I'm confident you can all do this. You multiply this out, um, simplify. What you're gonna get is 204s. Well, actually, I'm gonna do one step before plus 204t uh, plus 204 equals zero. That's what you get when you multiply this out. You bring the 9 over. It just gets, it's very simple. Okay? I assume you all know that you can do this yourselves. Okay? I don't want to use class time on this. So, of course, I can cancel out the 204, right? I just get S plus T plus 1 equals 0. And therefore, S is equal to minus 1 minus T. So now, what's the solution? Now I can actually tell you what the solution to this to the system is. Okay, everyone see what I did here? Okay, so you have to be careful though. Okay, your solution is x and, and y now. Okay, I'm, I'm just instead of writing it the ordered pair, I'm just going to write it this way. So x we already had uh, as 15 plus 51t, right? Here's where you have to be a little careful. Okay. I want you guys to pay attention to this. This is going to, about two of you or three of you, this will screw you up if you don't pay attention to this part. Some of you, uh, probably two of you, are going to say, y is minus 1 minus t. That is not true. y is 3 plus 4s. s is minus 1 minus t. y is 3 plus 4 times minus 1 minus t. You see that? Be careful at the end, okay? And this ends up being uh, minus 1 minus 4t. So there's your solution. So what is this really saying? Um, I, I want you to sort of put this in, back in, in perspective here. Your problem was to solve the equation 4x plus 51y equals 9. Um, this, is the, this is a problem like in linear algebra. You're trying to find all integer solutions, not just the ones modulo something, all of them. Okay, so remember what you did in linear algebra, right? When you had parameters, what could the parameter? They could be anything. They could be any real number. In this case, the parameter is t, and it can be any integer. That is exactly what the solution set is. It's an infinite set. t 
T can be any integer. That's, that's understood. Does that make sense? OK? Yes? In the first part, we got x equal 15 plus uh, 51 t. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong for me to put that x into the original equation 4x plus 51y equals 9? We can get y equals minus 1 minus 4 p. Oh, right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if once you've got, yeah, once you've got X, um, you can, you can solve for Y just using the original equation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You, you can do this a little bit more quickly. The reason why I did it this way <clears throat> is just, to, again, sorry, <coughs> is just to reinforce this idea, this congruent solution idea. In practice, that's the way you would do it. You wouldn't do it, all this work, but I, I'm doing it just to, again, to get everyone comfortable with this congruent solution idea. Okay. But yes, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay, yeah. <coughs> yes. Yes. And so the point is, if you, for example, if you plug in 0 for t, you get minus 1. Um, let's see what, what's happening here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, right. So x is 15, and then uh, y is minus 1. And if you do, if you look at this, right, you, you, you plug this in, you, you get, I mean, you see it's satisfied, right? Okay, and you can do this for any value of t. It's going to work. Okay, I spent a lot of time on that. Um, so, is this okay? All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, now you, you basically should be ready to do the first two problems at, at this point. I'm going to do uh, the next part of this section called the Chinese Remainder Theorem. Uh, there was something else I was going to do. I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to have time for that. Um, but I am going to talk about the Chinese remainder theorem. I should be able to finish that. And then you will be able to do a couple more problems. And I'll do on Thursday what I did today. I'm going to try to go through a couple more problems, give you some tips, and then we'll finish off the section on Thursday. Okay? All right. Okay, so now I'm going to get back to section 4.4. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really doing a whole lot today, but... Um, Hopefully, going through some problems you found to be helpful, I hope. I could be wrong if I'm not remembering a theorem, but I think this is just theorem 1. If I'm wrong, you can tell me. Is it theorem 2? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I was wrong. There we go. Quick fix. <laughs> All right. As you know, I don't really like erasing. I'm still not, I don't know if I remember how to do it. So, um, theorem two, Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, um, how many of you saw this in discrete math? Maybe some of you did, a couple of you did. Okay. All right, well, most of you haven't seen it yet. Um, so, this is going to. Unfortunately, I have to state it's in general. You're going to see a lot of letters here, but um, I'm hoping to explain this in a way so that you at least kind of understand the gist of what this is saying. So here's the statement. So we're going to let, um, I'm just going to follow the book's notation, n1, n2, on down to n sub r be positive integers. Um, suppose, and this is an important condition, suppose also that, okay, the GCD, this is a little abstract here, of n sub i comma n sub j is equal to 1 for i not equal to j. And I'm going to pause here for a second because I want to make sure that this makes sense. Again, I have to state this in the general form here, so this is why I need all these indexes. All this is saying, this is all this is saying, is that if you pick any two different, uh, any two distinct um, numbers from this list, from n1 through nr, that they're relatively prime. That's all it's saying. That any two of them are relatively prime. Okay. <clears throat> Then, so that's part of the condition of our set. 
Yes. Yes, it's a set of, these are going to end up being the, the, the moduli of a system of congruences. <clears throat> Because we need this supposition in order for the theorem to be true. <laughs> so this is sort of like saying, you know, um, if x and y are even, then x plus y is even. But we had to have that assumption in order to know that x plus y was, was even. Because if we didn't assume that, then maybe it wouldn't be even, right? I mean, sometimes you, you have to impose some conditions in order for the conclusion to be true. I mean, it's, it's not the case, for example, that the sum of any two in integers is even. That's just not true. So we have to say, we have to make some restrictive condition in order to guarantee that the sum is even. And so in this case, we have to make this restriction in order to get the result that we want. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at uh, multiple congruences now. Instead of just solving one, we're going to be solving a bunch at the same time. Then this system, x congruent to a1 mod n1, x congruent to a2 mod n2, and we're just going to, this is just going to continue all the way down to x congruent to a sub r mod n sub r. Okay. Has a I'm I'm just going to say this just to be clear. What do I mean by this? Hopefully from linear algebra you you know what this means. It means the value of x that satisfies all of them at the same time, right? Okay. What's that? No, well, no, no, because the solution is just actually a single number. It's not. It's not actually a, a vector. It's just we're just looking for one number that we plug in for x that makes it all all of them true. I mean, yes, you could think of it as a vector, but it's just a it's just a one-dimensional vector, right? But but no, I mean, it's it's not it's not a vector because. These these uh, x's on the other side don't don't vary. There's just one of them. There's just one. And the solution is also unique. Mod uh, the product of all these guys n one times n two on down to n sub r. <clears throat> okay, so the only thing I really need to do here, and this is something I really have to do because you're going to have you're going to be using this um, the an idea and the proof in order to solve some of your problems. I'm just going to show you what the solution is. I'm not really going to do much with, as far as the proof goes, but you should know how to get the solution because you're going to use that in some of your homeworks. Okay, so it's a little tricky, but it's really just an algorithm. You can just follow it. I mean, there's a very specific way to come up with the solution here. All right. Here's the idea. You said everything you wrote, right? You lost me about halfway through. Okay. I think because of all the letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, right. So let me just say this again here. So we're trying to, to solve the following system. X is congruent to A1 mod N1. X is congruent to A2 mod N2. X is congruent to A3 mod N3. All the way down to X is congruent to AR mod N sub R. Uh, no, I have. I have. And so that, that system that I just said has a solution and it's unique modulo, the product of all of those moduli, n1 times n2 all the way down to n sub r. Yes, given the fact that any two of those n uh, numbers are relatively prime. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's there's a lot there's a and there's a lot of notation here, but but yeah, that I stated all of it now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Once you've got the indices down. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so here's the idea. All right, so, and, and this is important. You, you really kind of need to know how to get the solution, like I said. So we're going to let n, just to simplify the notation, n is going to be n1 times n2 times n3, you know, et cetera, on down to n sub r. Okay, and now for each 
k, it's assumed k is an integer now, um, for each k with uh, k between 1 and r, 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to r, in other words, um, we're going to let capital N sub k, and this is actually a lot easier than it looks at first, be um, n1 times n2 all the way down to n sub k minus 1 times n sub k plus 1 on down to n sub r. Okay. I'm, and just for the sake of time, I'm probably not going to write this, but I'm just going to say in words what this capital N sub k is. Capital N sub k is simply the product of all these n's with the, with the little n sub k thrown out. That's all it is. So for example, n, capital N sub 1 would be n2 times n3 times n4 all the way down to nr, right? Capital N sub 5 would be n sub 1 n times n sub 2, n sub 3, n sub 4, n sub 6, 7, 8, 9, right? You're just, you're just simply throwing out the, the k n in these, okay? Okay, then... Here's the thing to note that the GCD of, we're almost actually going to be done here in a second, the GCD of capital N sub K and little n sub K equals, okay, and I, I want you to think about this for a second. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on this. This is kind of the, the crux of the proof here. Although I'm not writing out a proof, I'm just going to tell you what the solution is. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Okay, well, Remember, what we know, and just, just to fix this, let's just make this a little bit simpler. So let's suppose that R was 5, okay? Um, well, capital N sub, let's say K is 1. Okay, well, what, what's capital N sub 1? It would be N sub 2, N sub 3, N sub 4, N sub 5. And then this is N sub 1. All of them are pairwise relatively prime. So if you take any two of them, they don't share any common factor. Okay, so the question is, what can you say about the GCD of the product of everything but n sub k and n sub k? That's really what we're looking at here. It, has to be one. it does have to be 1. What's that? That's what this is, yeah. Well, no, no, no. No, the GCD is not little n sub k, actually. Um, the GCD is equal to 1. Okay? Let, let me... I want to say something about this really quick, okay? I, and I, I really would like you guys to think about this. It's going to help you in the, in, the, in the problems, I think. Why does it have to be 1? Well, suppose it wasn't 1. Suppose it's bigger than 1. Well, then, in particular, we'd have to have some prime that divides both of them, right? If the GCD was 4 or whatever, well, 2 is a prime that divides 4. So there'd have to be a prime that divides both of them. Well, see, that's the point, though. If the GCD was bigger than 1, there'd be a prime that divides this and this. Well, okay, sorry, I was trying to simplify this to letting R be 5, but I'm kind of going back away from that now because I don't think that's really helping anything. Well, what if a prime divides this and this? Well, the prime divides n sub k, and it divides the product of all of these n sub i's that, with, with, with this, the k removed. But what do you know if a prime divides a product? It divides one of them, right? But since the n sub k is not in this product, that prime would have to divide something n sub something other than k and n sub k. But that contradicts the fact that those two guys are relatively prime. Okay, I, I know that kind of flew over some of your heads probably, but the point is that's, that's kind of how we make this work because this product does not contain n sub k. So if a prime divides them both, the prime will have to divide n sub k and something other than n sub k in that product. That contradicts the fact that whatever those two guys are are relatively prime. That's why the GCD is 1. Yes? I'm really confused because it says let big n sub k equal n1 times n2. Mm -hmm. But big, big N sub K is the product of all of these N sub I's except with the N sub K missing. That's, why, that's what this is denoting, is that the N sub K term is not in this product. So for K, but one, um, oh, 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 it's not, it's the one that Yes. I'm sorry, I thought little N sub K was just N. No, no, it's, it's actually one of these guys up here. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's why. I'm not writing it all out, but that's why the GCD is one. Okay, so, well, um, so what can we say about this congruence? By the way, I know this is probably getting really heavy now, but we're almost done. Really, we are almost done. Um, N sub k x congruent to 
1 mod um, n sub k. Okay. It's a little bit abstract now, but I want you to, I'm going to ask you a question. Look at what we have on the screen here. Does this congruence have a solution? This is just a single congruence now. Now we're going back to what we've already done before. Why? Because the GCD of this and this is one, right? And one divides everything. So, and then of course, again, because the GCD is one, that's how many solutions are. There's a unique solution. There's only one modulo n sub k, little n sub k, I should say, right? So this uh, congruence, I'm just going to abbreviate this, uh, has, all right, I'm sorry, I'm getting stuck here, has a unique solution. I'm going to call this um, x sub k mod little n sub k. Okay. I only have one more sentence to write and then we'll be done. I'll wait till you have this down. And then... Okay, so how much more time do we need here? You guys got this? I need to wait a, just a few seconds if I can if you need me to. You good? Okay. All right. So I wish I could throw this all on a single page here, but um, here's the solution. I'm going to call that. I'm going to put a little bar over this just to for clarity here. A1 capital N1 x sub 1 plus A2 capital N2 x sub 2 plus all the way down to a sub r, capital N sub r, x sub r, is a solution to the system. And as I said, well, in the statement of the theorem, it's unique modulo the product of all of the moduli, n1 times n2 on, on down to n sub r. I was going to prove that, but I, I get the sense that your brain might be overloaded at this point. I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, it's not hard to prove that it's unique, but I won't. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, okay, so just to recap, remember what the a sub i's were. These were the coefficients on the right-hand side of the congruences. Okay, capital N, right? We define those, right? So product of all the little n sub i's, except for whatever that that subscript is thrown out. That one thrown out, and we know what the x one, the x one, x two, x threes are, right? They're the unique solutions to those corresponding congruences that I just defined on the, at the bottom of the last page. So all of these things I have up here, I've defined for you previously, and so you just have to compute it. That's it. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I what I may do here. Um, And I know you probably want to leave, but I, th I think just because this assignment is, you're going to find that this, this is going to be a little tedious and it's going to be a little tricky. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about one more homework problem before we go, okay? I mean, it's only 10 minutes and I, it's really going to be to your advantage, I think, okay? Of course, if you want to just walk out, you can if you want to. I just, and then, what's that? I said, are you kidding? Okay, okay. Okay, so I, I'm still, what I could do at this point is do a problem that involves this, but I think what I'm going to do is just, just because I want to saturate your brain with, the, with these fundamental techniques as much as possible, I think I'm still going to go back to number one and talk about another one of these problems. We'll talk about some of these on Thursday, okay? And again, remember, you have a week and a half before this is due, so you still have, we still have time to do this. Okay. Um, I do have one question. Yes. Yeah. Is that our result? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this, this is what the solution is to that system. It's this. In practice, it's going to just require some computation. But if, if you follow through what I what I gave you, it tells you exactly how to find it. Um, and we'll talk. We'll we'll definitely do something like with this on Thursday for sure. I just don't know if I have time to go through one right right now. So um, okay. So this one is actually the book gives you a hint. This one's a little little trickier. One F is to solve 
And this is another one where I think it's important for you to see this technique because now the numbers start to get a lot bigger. 140x congruent to 133 mod 301. And if I don't finish it, I'll at least have gotten you started on this. 140, 130, and 301? Uh, 140x congruent to 133 mod 301. Yes. Okay, so... Again, remember, the, and the book gives you, gives you a hint here. Um, of course, you could figure this out probably yourself, but the GCD of 140 and 301, remember that's always what you check first, right? Is seven. I think the book gives you this. And you can check that seven divides 133. I think it's seven times 19 or something like that. This is 133. So um, remember, that's, that's always what you do first. Every single one of these, you always do this first. If, and you probably have one, at least one of these, probably the GC doesn't divide B, in which case you're done. You can say, oh, okay, no solution. All right, so how many solutions are there? Seven, right? All right, so yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, of course, yep. So once you know, once you know one of them, then you just add n over d, and then you just keep doing that until you get all of them. Until you, and of course you stop once you have the seventh one. Okay, so um, now what can we do to to simplify this? So we have one forty x. Congruent to, okay, 133 mod 301. Okay, now what you should be thinking again is just everything you can do to try to make these numbers smaller. That is what you're trying to do. And again, if you can get the coefficient in front of x to be 1 or minus 1, then you've got, in, then you're really in good shape. Well, um, what can, okay, does anybody have any ideas of what we can, can do here? And then I'm going to tell you it doesn't involve multiplying by anything at first. Divide everything by 7. Remember, you can always do that. You can, so remember what I said before, if you can factor out something from both the coefficients that's relatively prime to the modulus, you can just cancel it out and leave the modulus the same. But you can always divide through by, as long as something divides all of them, you can divide everything through by whatever you want. Okay? Yes, but you have to do it to the modulus too. Yep. So I want to be very clear. This is this is. I think I, I gave this to you as a lemma. I'm pretty sure. Um, so divide by seven, and again, when I say divide, well, it'll be clear, right? I'm dividing everything by seven. So um, this gets things down reasonably well to smaller numbers. So 20x is congruent to 19 mod 43. Okay. Now, it's it's just going to be another kind of trick that we did before, really. Uh, yeah. No, no. So you have to be careful that once you get this solution here that, um, oh, sorry, sorry. So, um, yeah, so about any integer x is a solution to this if and only if it's a solution to this. So yes, sorry, these have the same solutions. But when you, you your ultimate goal is to get all the solutions modulo 301. So when you actually get a value of x here, you're going to be adding n over d, but the n is the original modulus, 301, okay? That's, that, that's the important thing that you, you want to remember, okay? Because that's, that's, that's our goal, is to, is to get all of these modulo 301. Um, so now we've got this now. Okay, so what is it that I said? I said try to multiply by something so that you can reduce these numbers down, these coefficients down to significantly so you can get something in smaller magnitude, maybe positive, may, maybe negative, right? Um, but there is something we can do here. There's actually a number we can multiply by that's not very big. I have a question. Yes. You um, you said if we could get it to where one was, to where, um, for example, this we have the situation now where the the twenty is exactly one more than the nineteen. Right. Which, is, which wasn't that the. No, 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 no. What we wanted was the the. I mean, if possible, and it's not always possible for the number to be one more than the modulus. The modulus oh, is forty three oh, in this modulus. case. Okay, sorry. So in this case, well, there's no nice, simple, easy way to do this, but we can at least multiply. There's something we can multiply by so that we can reduce these numbers in magnitude a lot. Anybody? Anybody think of what we can use? Yeah. Two. Two. 
We can just use two. Okay. Okay. Now we're not multiplying through the modulus now. We're just okay. So what do we get when we multiply by two? We get forty x congruent to thirty eight mod forty three, right? And remember, remember, okay, I can't stress this enough. You have negative numbers at your disposal. These actually will help you, okay? What is 40 mod 43? Remember, one way of thinking of it, okay, well, it's the remainder. Remainder is 40. You can't change it. Well, yes, but if you use negative numbers now, 40 is the same thing as minus 3, right? And 38 is the same thing as minus 5. So now we've reduced the, the magnitude down quite a bit. Yes? Um, so we can do that again. Wait, say that again? 20 and, oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you can always multiply by anything you want. Anytime you have a congruence, you can multiply both those, those coefficients by anything, and it's still preserved. You can always, you can't always uh, divide through, okay, so the point is, you can multiply both sides, both of those coefficients by anything you want to. As far as dividing, you can divide through by a number that divides all three, but then you have to divide all three by that number. But if, if, what you're, if you factored out something from both of these that's relatively prime to the modulus, you can cancel it. So those are the three things that you can do. So you're saying that, so you're saying this 40 is the same thing as negative? Negative three, yes. The mod 43. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh yeah, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are you guys, are you guys with me here? The forty and the minus three. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So now you've got these small numbers, and so at this point, um, what is it you're looking for? Well, you're you're looking for a value of x between zero and forty-three. Okay. I'm gonna. Uh, so we need. I'm I'm just gonna summarize this really quickly. So what we need now is we need forty-three to divide. Um, 5, I'm going to just shuffle the algebra around a little bit. 5 minus 3x, right? Okay, I mean, minus 3x minus minus 5 is plus 5. We'll just put the 5 on the other side. Well, now, you might think, oh, well, this is hard. Well, it's not really now because you can eliminate all these numbers really quickly because they're just not big enough, right? Plug in 0, what do you get? You get 5. Plug in 1, what do you get? You get 2, right? Plug in 2, what do you get? You get minus 1. Plug in 3. See, these numbers are too small for 43 to divide it. So you can eliminate all of these just by inspection right away because they're just too small. Okay, you see that? So really, it, it, you can immediately skip to, you know, yeah, I mean, but in this case, you can go through it really quickly, right? I mean, for example, plug in 10, what do you, what do you get? Minus 25. 43 is not going to divide it. It's not big enough. So you can immediately go, go past those. And it's pretty quickly, this isn't actually that hard, you can see that 16 is going gonna, is gonna to work. Okay? 16 times 3 is minus 3 is minus 48. So you get minus 43, and that's it. But you can see that you can do this really by inspection really quickly without calculators and these big numbers now. No, no, no. I mean, at this point, I can say, okay, well, you use some of the theory to, to break it down to something manageable, and you can just eyeball it, and it's easy, really, at this point. I went through that fast because uh, we're running out of time here, but... <laughs> so you had now that we need 43 to be able to divide... 5 minus 3x. Right, so the congruence we had before was minus 3x is congruent to minus 5 mod 43. So when we subtract the minus 5 over, it becomes plus 5, and that's where the 5 minus 3x is coming from. Right, yeah, because it's just not big enough. And that's what's helpful having the small numbers is because you can eliminate a lot of the smaller ones right away. Okay, and so 16 will work. This isn't the, okay, I'm going to stop here. This isn't, remember, there's seven solutions, so, right, so you have to add n over d to this. You have to add 301 over 7. Right? To get, and you just keep adding that until you get all seven of them. Of course, the, the solution's in the back of the book anyways, but this is, this is how you go about getting the first solution. So, number seven is just that 43. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. So you're just adding 43 enough times to get seven solutions. So hopefully this helped you out a little bit. Now you kind of have a better sense of how to proceed with this stuff. So no new homework, right? That's, that, I'm not adding to your assignment. That's it. Okay, so then Thursday we'll finish this up. We'll do some more problems. Okay, but I would just encourage you to get working on this before too late because you do have your exam coming up next week. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the 38 
is the same, same thing as minus 5 mod 43. So you subtract 43? Yeah, if you take 38 minus 43, you get minus 5. Good modulus is Yep. I don't, yeah. I have questions. Yes? If I'm not going to be allowed to do it. What makes the seventh solution? 